I want to start by um, giving my thanks to the organizing committee that put this event together, the Office of Multicultural Student Programs and Services, the Institute for Latino Studies, and everyone, all of the workers, all of the students who put this event together. Y para todos los padres y madres y otros miembros de familia, bienvenidos. Y gracias por todo lo que han hecho para apoyar a sus hijas e hijos. Felicidades. I, I was told that I should speak for only two minutes, um, but professors can't do that. I wasn't told to speak for only two minutes. I'll speak for a little more. Um, so I want to share with you in the time that I have some reflections based upon my 63 years of age and my 34 years of being a member of the academy as a professor and an administrator. And as some of you who have taken some of my classes won't be surprised to find, what I want to do is to share with you some thoughts about leadership and what I think is the source and the hope of the leadership our country, our Catholic Church, and our world need in the 21st century. To be more precise, I want to suggest to you that the source of leadership that is needed in the 21st century will come from your values, and the hope driving that leadership will be provided by your vision, values and vision. I call you to build on the values you have gained here at Notre Dame and use them to ground you in all of your work. But don't be satisfied with success solely at your work. I call you to be bold, to be thoughtful, to be passionate and compassionate in deciding what the meaning of your life will be to you, your family, your community, your church, your nation, and the world. Think of it this way. What is the vision that you have for what legacy you will leave your children and your grandchildren? This is for the graduates. Now, it seems a bit odd. Why would I ask young people to think about the legacy they're leaving their children and their grandchildren? What I want to tell you is that if you think of legacy, what kind of understanding, what kind of empathy, what kind of love you want to leave the most precious gifts God will ever give you, the next generations, you will make different decisions, better decisions, more Christ-centered decisions than you would otherwise make. Use your values to live the vision that will drive you to have a life that makes a difference in the world. Now we know that there are two basic types of leaders in the world today, and perhaps there have always been two basic types of leaders. One type of leader is a transactional leader. A transactional leader is the type of leader that we're most familiar with. This is the person who is highly accomplished and professional, a doctor, a lawyer, a minister, a business person, well-educated, they do their jobs well, they're committed. They give back to the University of Notre Dame once they leave. You're all supposed to laugh at that. And they especially give back to the Institute for Latino Studies when they give back to Notre Dame. They're the people who lead hospitals and law firms and companies and uh, consulting firms, and they're appreciated by their organizations. But those types of leaders ultimately are simply, I want to suggest to you, routine decision makers who do their jobs well in a, within established expectations. You might even consider the possibility that in their professional work, these types of leaders could be, could be replaced by many of their colleagues who are as equally accomplished, equally educated, equally committed to their work. What I'm asking you to be is a different type of leader, the type of leader that is driven by her and his values and vision. And that type of a leader is what I'm going to call a transformational leader. Now, this leader also exercises great responsibility, works hard, achieves her or his position because of their work ethic. However, this type of leader is not satisfied with just doing well in traditional organizations according to traditional expectations. 
The transformational leader has as her or his driving motivation to move their organization, to move their coworkers, to move their students, if they're teachers or professors, their communities and their families to achieve goals they never thought about, to find inspiration in new and better ideas. Think of it this way. The transformational leader brings new, larger, richer goals to organizations, communities, and families. She and he work to empower coworkers, friends, and family members to see their potential in ways that they never previously considered. The transformational leader most significantly is not satisfied with just serving those his or her organization or community have always served. They push their organizations and communities, and I suggest to you their governments and their churches to serve those that these institutions and organizations and communities and even families have never served before. And they look to their deepest values to find a bigger, brighter, more inclusive vision of the future. Like many of you here, graduates, and many of us in this room, I'm not supposed to be with you here today. To many people, the odds were stacked against me. No one in our neighborhood had gone to college. Many of my classmates' parents did not have the chance to have very much formal education. I grew up in a highly segregated neighborhood in Corpus Christi, Texas. My elementary school was 100% Latino and African American. My middle school was 100% Latino and African American. My high school had maybe 1% Caucasian students. It was not until I went to college at Harvard that I attended a predominantly white educational institution. And now that I think of it, I think it was the first predominantly white institution I had ever been part of. Now, my grandparents immigrated from Mexico in the early 1900s. My father's family, the Fragas, moved to Texas in 1905 from Ojuelos, Jalisco. My father, Leo, was born outside of Laredo, Texas in 1911. My mother's family, the Dovalinas, moved to Texas in 1915 from Via Union Coahuila in Mexico. My mother Rosa was born in 1924 in Eagle Pass, Texas. My grandparents came here without papers because at that time, you didn't need them to come to the United States. One could say they came here legally, but that's because it was impossible for them to come to the United States illegally because we didn't have that category in our law. That category wasn't established until 1927 with a specific piece of legislation during a time of economic downturn in our country. I, I tell you this because it's an important fact that I think sometimes we very conveniently forget today. Now, my parents were very fortunate for Latinos and Latinas of their generation. My father graduated from high school in 1929, one of three students to graduate. There's a story that my grandmother, Isabel, we have a daughter named after my grandmother, had a conversation with my dad. My dad used to tell this story, and, and my grandmother appropriately said, mijo, we all know what mijo means, right? Dear beloved son, mijo, there are two choices that people like us have. This is in South Texas. You can try to get an education, or you go work in the fields. And as a good Mexican mother, she said, and you're going to get an education. She gave him a choice, and then she told him what to decide. <laughs> I love the picture of him in his high school graduation gown wearing a bow tie. Now, my mother also graduated from high school in 1941. She was the only one of her 13 siblings to have a high school diploma. My uncles, the story is, said to her, as the baby of the family, at least one of us is going to graduate from high school. You don't have to work to be able to provide for the family. My mom was the baby of 13 children. And her father died. My grandfather, who I didn't know, died in 1940. In 1940. And um, he had lost everything during the Depression. And it was very difficult for the family to get along. I know now, nonetheless, how blessed my parents were. My father told stories of how he, his mother, and sisters lived on the streets in Laredo with no place to sleep. I don't know how my maternal grandmother fed so many children. My mom was the baby, as I said, 
Although they were not blessed with material well-being, my parents were, however, blessed with a deep faith in God and a deep faith in the value and virtue of believing deeply, personally, and publicly in their Catholic faith. It was given to them by their parents, I know, and I have to think that it was their faith that gave them the strength to look beyond the challenges that confronted them. My parents were blessed as well, interestingly, and maybe even oddly enough, by being young adults during World War II. Now, this was a very challenging time for our country. My father was in the Navy. In fact, he was um, asked to enlist in the Navy because he spoke English and Spanish and was biliterate, writing English and Spanish as well. He listened into telephone conversations that were happening. It was the beginnings of naval intelligence. He listened into telephone conversations that were going on between the United States and Mexico and other parts of Latin America during World War II. And when, when someone would say, pues pienso que van a mandar mi hijo a, I think my son is going to be shipped to, he would cut off the phone conversation because you couldn't talk about that, because it might, there's someone might be listening who shouldn't be listening. My mother was a telephone operator. They worked on opposite sides of the wall. My mother connected the phone conversations. My dad disconnected the phone conversations. <laughs> a dear friend of hers, Irene, helped them begin to court. Uh, my mother was the baby, as I said. She had older brothers. They were not excited about my mother beginning to talk to a sailor who was there on a temporary basis before my dad shipped out to Hawaii for the last two years of the war. The point I'm trying to make here about my parents and the war and their courtship is that they lived at a very special time in our country, a time when the country came together. Now, they're both gone. Some of you know my mom passed on just three weeks ago. I miss her very much, I miss my dad very much. He passed on in 1997. But my mother and father were part of a generation of Americans that demonstrated that if the country came together in a time of great need and had faith in a limitless future and a sense of responsibility, that you could build communities of understanding and inclusion. Now, don't misunderstand me. My parents had great difficulties. They were living in South Texas. Um, they experienced tremendous amounts of discrimination and lack of job opportunities um, and so forth. But my parents had faith in what was possible in this country if you tried to help the country live up to its highest ideal. They had an ever-present faith in God and an ever-present faith in our country's limitless future. Now, I tell you all of this because as I reflect on my own experiences and path regarding leadership, I know that it's grounded in my deep Catholic faith and an equally deep faith in a limitless future that came from my parents and that came from my grandparents before them. The values and vision that I think have given me the opportunities that have led me to be here with you today came from those values and vision that I inherited from my parents and my grandparents. My mother and father, whatever the limited opportunities that they had, were still very active in their community. They were leaders in the church. My dad taught, for those of you who remember, CCD classes. We used to call it doctrina um, in the old days. I don't know if it's still called that in some communities. My mom was a church leader. She was a charismatic. Uh, she was involved in the establishment of comunidades de base. She went out in her 70s to the doors next door and the houses next door, what has now become a particularly rough neighborhood, knocking on doors and trying to evangelize people in our Catholic faith. What I learned from my parents is that if you give yourself the chance, just give yourself the chance to in fact live the values that drive you to be your best. You can do things no matter what the limits, no matter what the costs are, 
that you face and experience. Community, faith, family, and nation were one to my parents. I learned that lesson from them, and I want to suggest it's a lesson that can be learned and internalized by many of you. Now, it's not hard to determine if you're a transformational leader, a leader who is not satisfied with only his or her own success, but also has the values and visions to help their coworkers, organizations, neighborhoods, churches, and communities grow to be stronger, more inclusive, more understanding, and I think our faith teaches us more loving than ever before. You just have to ask yourself three sets of very simple questions. Question number one, am I putting myself in a position where I am out of my comfort zone? If you're always in your comfort zone or you're just barely out of your comfort zone, you're not taking sufficient risks to make a difference in your lives. Informed risks, but risks without a guarantee of success. A second question you need to ask yourself that's very simple is, would my parents, grandparents, and ancestors who sacrificed so much for you to be here, having the opportunities that you have, maybe enduring discrimination and other struggles, would they be proud of the decisions you're making and what you're doing now? If they're proud, I think you're working toward becoming a transformational leader. Do you have goals? Do you have expectations of yourself that you would be proud to explain to your parents and grandparents? Third question, am I helping others in my work and in my life, especially those who are not accustomed to getting help? Am I expanding opportunities to those who have few? Am I working with those who others would not expect me to work? Three simple questions. Now I've had a blessed life and I think I've tried to use those questions to be able to assess whether or not I have been a transformational leader. Don't get me wrong, I've had a blessed life, not a perfect life. Decisions that we make sometimes are wrong and these three questions help us recenter ourselves to try to make better decisions than those that have taken us off track. When my parents learned that I had the opportunity to go the summer after my junior year of high school to study at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, this was a young Mexicanito, Chicanito, who had not been north of San Antonio, Texas, had the chance to get on a plane for the second time in my life and fly alone to Bar Harbor, Maine, good Latino parents should have said what? No, mijo, está muy lejos. <laughs> kind of like some of you may have experienced in the course of, no, son, that's too far away. You don't know what that is. We don't know what that is. What if something happens? How are we going to be able to help you? No, mijo, it's too far away. But they didn't say that. They said, okay, what do we need to do to help you? They got out of their comfort zone to give me an opportunity. They also said, we can't help you pay for your plane ticket. <laughs> and we can't help you pay your, for your health insurance that you need. So you're going to have to go find the money and you're going to have to go ask organizations to give you money to support that. They put me out of my comfort zone right away. But we all work together for that common goal of giving me a chance that I would otherwise never have had and never dreamed of. I had never seen a pine tree. I had never seen a mountain. The instructions to go there said, bring your hiking boots. I had no idea what hiking boots were. You don't do hiking in South Texas. You walk. You know, when you don't have a car, you walk. You don't go, you don't go hiking. But I learned about all those things because my parents gave me that chance by taking an informed risk. I was one of 20 high school students who was working at the Jackson Laboratory. I happened to work with a biochemistry professor named Robert Blake. We studied the amino acid content 
of the urine of lethargic mice. <laughs> now, how do you get samples of lethargic mice? <laughs> These mice had been bred to be lethargic, and we were studying a particular genetic variation of those mice. I can tell you about that afterwards, but it's not appropriate conversation for mixed company. But in any case, when I came back home, I had had a set of experiences that broadened my understanding of the world, and it was my parents who gave me that chance. I was the only non-white student in that group of 20. I was one of the two working class students in that group. The organization group does group the two of us together. But I learned there about the Ivy Leagues. I learned there about the opportunities that were available if you got outside of your comfort zone. Now, when I went to Harvard, I was one of 15 students who were Latino or Latina in an entering class of 1,600. We're um, called, we call ourselves, I should say, the Harvard 15. Uh, about 10 of us graduated, the rest left at one point or another and finished up in other colleges and universities um, around the country. Two of my classmates were someone who dropped out, who's become a little famous. His name is Bill Gates Jr. Um, organized something called Microsoft um, and at one point was one of the most wealthy persons in the world. And, and another one of my classmates was John Roberts, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, with all due respect, with whom I share virtually nothing in terms of values and expectations. But my point here is simply that if you get out of your comfort zone, you begin to understand and be with people who might give you, might give you the self-confidence you need to continue to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Now, my decision to be a professor was a decision that certainly put me out of my comfort zone. And, it, and I didn't know anybody who had a PhD. I didn't have any professors who said, you should do this. I decided I wanted, I wanted to do it on my own. And you know why? I decided I wanted to do it on my own because I never had a Latino professor. I never had a Latina professor. I never had a professor who was interested in Latino or Latina communities at this magnificent university that gave me an incredible education and provided all sorts of opportunities, but I knew something was missing. And I said, maybe if I try to be one of those professors, maybe I can help other students not feel the way that I did. Not sure that you belong. Not sure that what you want to study can be supported. Students have the opportunities to study whatever it is they want to study. But for those who want to study particular communities, universities, as we have over time come to learn, perhaps have a contractual obligation with those students to have the faculty members who can help them with their interests. I've committed myself to this work, you might say, because in trying to be a transformational leader, I know that I have become a better person, but it was by taking those risks and pursuing work that I think my parents would be proud of, my grandparents would be proud of, and I was trying to expand opportunities to communities, to students who didn't have those opportunities in the past. Now, being a transformational leader isn't always easy. Being a transformational leader has its challenges. When you push yourself out of your comfort zone, you can fail, and sometimes you do, or Others push you to fail because they don't recognize the work that you do or the sacrifices that you do, or you make wrong decisions at times. But the key is to keep trying, to learn from those experiences, and to be in a position to better understand what it is you can do, what it is you can contribute, and how it is that you can make a difference in the lives of others. You know what our demographic numbers say. Latinx, Latinx, Latina, Latinos are 35% of all Catholics in the United States, 52% of all Catholic millennials, and 60% of all Catholics under 18. 60% today. 18% of our national population, one quarter of all students in K through 12 across the country right now, one can argue, are Hispanic or Latinos. The decisions you make 
regarding what kind of a leader you will be. And make no mistake, you will be recognized as a leader. You know why? Because you're graduating from Notre Dame. Because very few people graduate from Notre Dame. Because you've been given this tremendous opportunity, you have responsibilities and others will put responsibilities on you. But you're always in a position to decide whether you want those leadership opportunities or not, or rather, rather what kind of leader you're going to be. There's much at stake if you do not commit yourself to the work of being a transformational leader. Our nation and especially our church will be shaped by the decisions that you make. I don't have to tell you how challenging times are now for our country and for our world and for our church to make better decisions in many different ways. You are the generation that will push our country and our church and our world to perhaps make better decisions than we have made in the past. Now there is a fundamental tenet, as I close, of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the order of priests that founded, has governed, and inspires with our Blessed Mother, all of us who work here and all of us who study here, a fundamental tenet, a foundational belief, and that is in divine providence. Divine providence is a belief that God has a plan for each of us, that God does not give us opportunities without a divine purpose if we are open to understanding our responsibilities in that way. Why are we all here this evening? Why are you soon to be graduates of Notre Dame? Why did you have the love and sacrifice of your parents and grandparents to make your success possible? Might it be the case that you were here for a reason? That this is part of God's plan? Might it be the case that you are here right now in this sacred space and place in your lives to commit yourselves to develop the values and vision to be a transformational leader. Only if you're open to accepting God's plan. Notre Dame has given you tremendous opportunities, challenges as well, and tremendous opportunities. Maybe that isn't just by chance. Maybe there's a larger plan for what you have the responsibility to do with those opportunities. I think you're all up to that challenge. I think you all have the capacity. I know some of you have that capacity. I've had you as students in class. I know all of you have that capacity to live up to those challenges, but you'll only live up to those challenges. You'll only live up to those expectations if you have higher expectations of yourself. Use those higher expectations. I assure you, you'll live a better life. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on this very special weekend. Congratulations to you and your families for all you have accomplished, and especially for what you will accomplish in your future. My generation did it wrong. My generation is leaving you a legacy of tremendous, tremendous challenges. Please, please do a better job. My children need you to do a better job. They'll work with you on it. My one day, we don't have any yet. My wife, Charlene Aguilar, and I, we don't have any grandchildren yet, but my grandchildren need you to make those better decisions. Buena suerte y que Dios los bendiga. Good luck and may God bless you, your families, our Catholic Church, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you.